This morning, I don't want to be long. I do want to be strong. We want to look at Revelation chapter 21. We thank Brother Jones for filling in the gap and basically laying the foundation of judgment. I'm sure uh, I, I heard he did a good job, and of course, that's not no surprise, but he informed us about judgment and about the fact that God is going to judge the secrets of men. And I'm going to tell you something. That can be something that can make you shout or something that'll make you pout. I mean, it. I mean, secrets, secrets. All of us have them. I don't care how good you think you are. You've got secrets. Nobody knows the you that you are all the time. Amen. Amen. We might as well admit it. And, I'm, and, and, my, and you know what? Uh, at the truth of the matter is that though we think there are secrets, there's nothing hid from the face of God. And so a lot of our repenting, amen, has to do with what people know we've done and what we've known we've done. See, repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry for what people know you did. <laughs> Sometimes we're so image-driven that we repent of the things that we're aware that other people know about us. But there's a whole realm of things that we have gotten into that are called secret things. And David, even in his prayer to God, said, cleanse thou me from secret faults. Secret faults. Because we're as sick as our secrets. It is not the thing that people know we've done that, that, really, that really causes us to be drained of our spiritual vitality and power and vim and vigor. It is those secret things, having to walk around with something uh, that you really want to release. Now, what's the answer? The answer is not broadcasting your news and telling everybody all the intricate details of your secret sin. That's not the answer. The answer is acknowledging that that's what it is, that's what it is. amen, and confessing and throwing yourself before the mercy of God and asking God to purge you and to cleanse you from that which secretly destroys you. Because God, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the last verse, last two verses, said God is going to bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. Now watch this, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And if you think that dying will get you out of it, then you are sadly mistaken because the Bible says that the sea is going to regurgitate the dead and the grave is going to regurgitate that death is not even going to be an escape so the best thing to do is to be cleansed of those secrets and we appreciate brother jones for laying such a strong foundation for our theme for this month now i want to invite you to revelation <clears throat> chapter 21 and i want you to hold it there now I, I need to bring together two lessons because you really can't talk about going to heaven or going to hell without talking about other things judgment was one of them that was talked about last week death is another thing amen this subject right here is death we need to talk about it why because ain't none of, ain't nobody up in here gonna make it to heaven get out of this world alive did you hear what i said you're not gonna get out of here alive uh, you know, you can bun bus, you can tie bow, you can do all of that kind of stuff. You can accumulate a bunch of exercise videotapes, but you're not going to get out of here alive. And we invest a lot in our health and everything in this body. But the truth of the matter is there's going to be a great change. And, but well, let's read our text. Uh, let's read our text this morning, and then we're going to invite you to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and see if we can reconcile these two texts of Scripture and ultimately end up giving an illustration that heaven is where we're on our way to and heaven is worth dying for. Revelation chapter 21, the Bible says, beginning with verse number 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven, and the first earth were what? Passed away. And there was no more what? See, very significant there. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a what? Bride. As a bride. That's important. Prepared as a bride. Prepared as a bride. Not just looking like a bride, but prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and I will dwell with them, and they shall be, and I, they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God, ooh, this is good, and God shall wipe away all tears. Is that in your Bible? 
I just contend that heaven will be more of an exciting place for some than for others. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Now, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> and we're going to reconcile these. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse number 35, the Bible says this. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And what? And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be but bear grain, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him and to every seed his own body. Now look at verse number 50 of 1 Corinthians 15. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. All of us shall be changed. A heaven worth dying for. Back to Revelation chapter 21, we need to understand that John the Apostle, who was one of the youngest apostle, it is, uh, apostles, it is believed that John here, being the youngest apostle doing the incarnate Christ, is now the oldest apostle after the ascension of Christ. He is one of the oldest apostles, and right now he has been exiled to an island called Patmos. Where is John? island called Patmos. I want these things to stay with you. Revelation. He's writing Revelation under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ himself as he is exiled on an island called Patmos for preaching and teaching and holding up the name of Jesus. Now, one of the significant things about where he is is that he's on an island. One of the unique things about an island is that an island is surrounded by what? water. So John here, uh, his experience while he's exiled is he steps out and everywhere he sees, of course, in all directions, he sees water. Okay. Of course, he was not the only one exiled here, but here he was on this island in the middle of water, just sea all around him. And so God is giving him revelations. He's getting more while in exile than he got among the people. And so we need to, that, there's a principle in that, and that is we shouldn't always try to run away from the, from the lonely moments that God allows us to go through. Sometimes God puts us in an exile so that he can show us something that we wouldn't have noticed before. Sometimes God will allow something bad to happen to us because we are more, some of us, we are more inclined to hear God's voice in the middle of an exile than we are when we are crowded about with people. So here, John is in exile, and God used his exile to speak to him and to show him some visions. In Revelation chapter 21, the Bible says that one of the things that John saw, he says he saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. This is a vision of a future thing, but he noticed that there was no more sea. Why would John notice that there was no more sea? Here he was, exiled on an island of Patmos. His experience was water all around him, but he noticed in this new heaven and new earth that there was no more sea. Seas represent the thing that divides lands and countries and cultures and people. Seas, whenever we talk about somebody going to another country, we say they're going over what? 
seas. But this new heaven and new earth was not divided into continents and states and cities. It was one place. And there was no sea to separate land and country and peoples. And the Bible says that he saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Now, if you don't really know anything about old Jerusalem, you can't appreciate New Jerusalem. And so I want to encourage you when you study the word, don't just look over New Jerusalem as if you know what that is. You need to know that old Jerusalem was destroyed in A.D. 70. It was destroyed by Rome. Now, you need to also understand that because it was destroyed, uh, uh, it was supposed that the Christians and the Jews were done away with, uh, but the book of Revelation was written in such a way to where the enemies of the Christians could not understand what was written. So those who were Christians would naturally understand. Those who had come out of Judaism would understand. Even Jews would understand. So if someone from Rome found this letter and saw New Jerusalem, he might start looking for a new city, literal city being built. But John said, I saw a new Jerusalem as in contrast to the old Jerusalem that had been destroyed. But the difference was that this new Jerusalem, whereas the first Jerusalem was burned up in smoke, and ascended up, he saw this new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This Jerusalem, uh, now what, is, what John is seeing is he's seeing that there's an intimate relationship between the new Jerusalem and God and Christ. But it's just not an intimate relationship. She is prepared. If you remember the, the parable in Matthew 25 about the ten virgins, five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Five that were foolish did not bring oil for their lamps, but the five that were wise had oil for their lamps and they were prepared for the bridegroom. What is this talking about? Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. If you make it to heaven, it won't be because you haphazardly lived a life that was right. It won't be because you just coincidentally made good decisions. It will be because you prepared to go. There's no one that's going to end up in heaven who didn't intend to be there. Because the holy city is as a bride specifically prepared for her husband. He hears a voice, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, which is Emmanuel, which means God with us. God is showing intimacy. I will be with them. They will be my people. I will be their God. And then he says that he notices that God wipes away all tears. And I want you to look at the text because the Bible says, he says, God shall wipe away all tears. And there's a colon there. And then it says that there will be no more this, no more that, no more that, no more the other. What's going on? What, what, how, how is God going to stop the hemorrhage of tears from coming out of our eye ducts down our face? He's going to do it by taking away everything that causes tears. He says God will wipe away all tears. Then you see that little colon there. And then the Bible says, for there and there shall be no more death. Tears. How many of you have cried and shed tears over death? Some of you just this year had a rough year, lost some loved ones, shed some tears, but there ain't no such thing as losing a loved one in that celestial city. Sorrow. How many of you have ever been in sorrow and shed tears? And not only sorrow, but he says, nor crying. Crying is the crying causes tears. And he says, neither shall there be any more pain. How many of you have ever been hurt to the point where tears started running down your face or angered to the point and disappointed to the point where you couldn't stop the tears from falling down out of your eyes? God is going to remove everything that causes us to shed tears. Which, of course, is an indicator that if you have spent no time shedding tears down here, that's not something you can appreciate. He says, for the former things are passed away. And this is where we need to link what we read in Corinthians. The former things. What former things? We sing about heaven. 
We say, I'm going to walk the streets of what? Gold. Of gold. But do you think they're going to be literal streets of gold in heaven? Do you think for a moment that gold has value with God? Hmm. Do you think for a moment that the, that the gates are going to be pearly? Literal pearls? If you think for a moment that the walls are going to be literal jasper, then you are sadly mistaken because heaven is not a physical place. What is that all about? What God is doing is he's showing that the things that have value with us are in abundance and glory, mean nothing in glory. That's the analogy. Here, we wouldn't make streets of gold. Why? Because gold is too hard to come by enough to make streets. We wouldn't pay streets of gold. Why? Because gold, gold is too precious to use. What God is saying when it talks about streets of gold is it's talking about in heaven what the world value, it, the value system is upside down from here. And anyway, if your interest is to walk streets of gold and to see pearly gates, then you're probably not going to go to heaven. Hello, if your concern is more about seeing streets of gold and I wanna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the pearly gates and I'm going to pick one of them pearls out, you probably won't be going to heaven. You probably will be kicking brimstones. <laughs> but he says the former things are passed away. And one of the former things that are, that's going to be passed away is this body. Why? Because with this body, we cannot Go to heaven. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to show you something. What's going to happen? What's going to happen before we are able to enter into heaven's gates? What's going to happen, first of all, is what Paul talks about. See, in Paul's day, there were some skeptics who challenged Paul's teaching on the resurrection of the dead. And what they said is, well, okay, then what body are they going to be raised in if the dead are really going to get up? So Paul uses an agricultural example to give a spiritual illustration. He, he talks about a seed and how a seed is sown in the earth and how what comes as a result of the seed is more glorious than the seed itself. How many of you like watermelon? You, see, you're some, some of y'all lying. I know there's more than 10 people that eat watermelon up in here. It's just winter time. You don't like, like watermelon in the winter. But the watermelon and the watermelon seed are night and day. But they are inevitably cut, tied together because without that seed, you don't get the watermelon. Now, the watermelon doesn't even look like the seed. But it took that seed being put in an environment for it to die so that the watermelon could be born. So, so you cannot have both the seed and the watermelon at the same time. That the, are you with me? You're not going to have the seed and the watermelon that that seed that that and the and the watermelon that's produced by the seed at the same time. Something has got to die. And what Paul is saying is, if we want a glorious body, we've got to first understand that we have to die. The human body is remarkable. It, this body is remarkable. The average head has over 100,000 strands of hair. The average. You can be 5 foot 10 inches tall and your intestine, your small intestine, is over 25 feet long. Uh, the human body. It, it, is said, it is said that the, that the human body is such a complex organism. It's composed of systems working together, trying to accomplish what the head wants it to accomplish. But as complex and wonderful as our bodies are, guess what? Because of sin, our bodies were not built to last. You're dying. 
you're dying. Brother, Brother Hamilton, what you talking about? I just got, went to the doctor and everything. The doctor said everything was okay. And, you know, I, I, you know I'm taking my medicine. No, 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 no. You don't, you're not here. You're not getting what I'm saying. You are dying. No, no, not because, not because of any, any sickness or not because, not, but you are dying. You were born to die. When you were just a little zygote, a zygote, the result of your mother and your father, you were beginning the process of dying. When you moved from a zygote to a, a, an embryo, you were beginning the process of dying. When you moved from an embryo to a fetus, you were beginning the process of dying. As a matter of fact, we are so dying that it is said that before we leave any place where we find ourselves, we will shed at least 200 strands of hair. Our bodies are ever changing. You don't have the same body you had yesterday. You think you do. But you done combed your hair since then and took off 10 hairs there. You done lost some skin. We are dying. Because God, because the way sin came into the world and the way God set it up is for this not to be the final thing. So what God says is, I've given you a body for your environment. But then he says, Paul says, we're going to be changed. Why? Because our environment is going to change. And because our environment is going to change, our bodies have to change. If you don't believe God can do it, just look at the fish. We can't imagine going underwater and living and breathing, but the fish can't imagine being on land and breathing. God designed everything with a body to suit their environment. Just stay with me. He, he, he uh, created the polar bear and the penguin to be in the polar regions and can stand temperatures that are below freezing. And yet that polar bear survives all of the cold. Why? Because God designed its body for its environment. Just stay with me. I'm going somewhere. Oh, the tropical region. You have tropical birds and tropical fish and tropical reptiles. And they have bodies that can withstand outrageous heat and, and, and bodies that can uh, uh, withstand the scorching sun. Why? Because their bodies have been designed for their environment. Well, when Jesus comes again, the Bible says that, he's going, that we're going to change in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Why? Because time is going to fade away and eternity is going to come in and the, the environment for eternity cannot coincide with these temporary bodies that we have. So what God is going to do when Jesus comes again is every last one of us, I don't care what kind of body you got, tall body, short body, people body, little body, wide body, amen, you're going to be changed and you're going to be given a new body that can tolerate eternity. And the difference is, whereas this body is developmental, that body is instant. Go to 1 Corinthians 15, I need to show you this. You need to know this because, you know, you know somebody said, well, what's going to happen? I, the, the Bible tells us exactly what's going to happen. First Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse number 50. First of all, Paul establishes after dealing with bodies and, and dealing with the seed dying and dealing with the fact that the, glory, that, the, that the product of the seed is glorious. He says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of that. What are you talking about? Is he talking about, is he talking about being carnal as far as your, your, your behavior and your spirit? No, what he's saying is you cannot live in an eternal place with a temporary body. And I'm so glad of that. Do you know why I'm glad of that? Because I would hate to be in the middle of singing around the great white, th the great throne of God. And, and, and be, I'd hate to be in the middle of praising God with the angels and standing next to Peter and, and looking at Peter and singing and praising God and all of a sudden catch a cramp in my leg because something's wrong. With the, I'd hate to be walking uh, along with Jesus and all of a sudden uh, Jesus is saying, what's wrong? And I said, well, I didn't take my medicine today, Lord. I would hate that. I want a body where I don't have to worry about aches and pains and cramps and bruises and where I can be with the Lord forever how would you like having to go to some back room in the back of your mansion because you forgot to shoot your insulin and gotta go shoot your insulin and miss the song service I 
I wouldn't want heaven with this body. I wouldn't want heaven with this body because I'd still be subject to the sensuality of this body. I'd still be subject to the things my eyes could see that get me in trouble and the things my ears could hear that get me in trouble. I need a body that's going to guarantee that I'm not going to make a mess of myself and God is going to separate me from this body. Give me a new body. As a matter of fact, the new body is going to be so good that it'll be just like Jesus's. But this doesn't move you if you're not ready for glory. He says, he says, look at how instant. The Bible says, verse number 51, he, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, he says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Let me deal with it. We shall not all sleep. When Jesus comes again, everybody's not going to be dead. Everybody's not going to be physically dead, but everybody will be changed. You're not getting out of here alive in this body. The Bible says in a moment. Now look, this body came about in nine months. The body you have right now came in nine months. But the other body we're going to get is going to come in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. Why? Because the first body we have came as a result of our daddy and mama. God is going to just give us this new body. And it's going to happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at this last trump, the trumpet will sound, the dead shall be raised, how? Incorruptible. Now, now understand what it says when it says the dead shall be raised. This means that there's going to be a resurrection of the old person so that the new person can come about. And you know what? That's amazing, and I can't fathom that. I can't fathom that. Because if you die... And, some, and, and part of your body is overseas, and the other part here, and you, you, your human mind can't fathom that. But I'm going to tell you something. I heard somebody put it this way. If you died and your body turned to worms, and the bird ate the worms, and the fox ate the, ate the bird, and the lion ate the fox, when Jesus comes again, the lion is going to have to give up the fox. The fox is going to have to give up the bird. The bird is going to have to give up the worm. The worm is going to have to give you up because you're getting up again. to be changed. Why? Because we have to have an everlasting body for everlasting life. Now, let me share this with you because I like giving balance. God will make a body suitable for the environment where you be staying. Either way. Mm -hmm. yeah, not, yeah, let me talk to the side because I don't know. Did you hear what I said? He's going to give you a body for the environment where you'll be staying either way. Do you know why hell is forever? Because you'll have a body that can handle hell forever see, see the question is not whether or not we're going to have everybody's going to live forever question is where now the interesting thing about fire let me just say this the interesting thing about fire if you look all through scripture fire consumes am I right about it if someone burned this building down don't get any ideas But the fires would consume the bit. The consumption of fire is that it destroys one part and moves on to the next part. If you were on fire right now, the, and, you, and it started in your arm, your arm would be burned up, it would move up your shoulder, and your shoulder would be burned. It consumes fire, natural fire consumes, it consumes, it eats away at whatever it has a hold to. But the language of hellfire is not that it consumes, but that it torments. Why is it that, see, it's not going to be like the fire we know. When that, when that rich man was, had lost and woke up and lifted his eyes in hell, he said, he said, Abraham, tell Lazarus to dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. Not, he didn't say because I'm consumed in the flame. He says I am tormented in the flame because, because you will have a body that can be tormented by the fire but not consumed. 
And hell wouldn't be so bad if we were going in this body. If I was going in this body, hell wouldn't be so bad because as, as soon as I'm burned up, I'm burned up. But God is going to make sure that you have a body that can handle eternal punishment. It literally means that you will die forever. I thought dying was a process. No, this is called the second death. You will literally die forever. You will have eternal death. And he'll give you the body suitable for it. But of course, that doesn't apply to us in here. Because we're going to be in this number. We're going to be in this number that, that has, has a change in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trump. And somebody say, Brother Hamilton, well, what does that body look like? What, go, to first, go, to, go to first John chapter 3, verse 2. Uh, what does that body look like? I mean, is it going to be to where if, if I'm missing a finger on this side, am I going to be missing a finger on the next side? Because these were, these were some of the things the skeptics thought. Because in Jewish culture in that day, if you uh, were missing a limb, you couldn't even come to the temple. You lost, the law said that you couldn't come to the temple. You couldn't worship. You couldn't even work in that day. You had to beg if you were missing a limb. And so the concern was, what body are the dead going to be raised in? If I'm missing a limb here, will I be missing? in the limb then I don't know but I don't think so and then this is why I don't think so number one first of all we don't know what that body's going to look like but I don't think if you're missing a limb here you'll be missing a limb over there because the Bible says in first John chapter 3 around verse number 2 what does it say beloved, beloved now are now we the, are we sons, the of sons of God and it does not yet we don't know how we're going to look Read what we shall be, but what we shall be. Read, but we know that. But we know when we shall appear. That when he shall appear, we shall be like. We him. shall be like, like him. him. I don't know what it's going to look like right now. I don't know if I'm fat on this side. Am I going to be fat when my body gets changed? I don't know if I've got ashy knees on this side. Am I going to have ashy knees when he changes my body? I don't know if i got bad skin on this side. Am I, I, I don't know about that, but one thing I know, it's not going to be important because when we see him, we're going to see him the way he is now, and we're going to be like he is, and it's not going to be important what my waist size is or what my hair color is what's important is we can see Jesus as he is and be like him forever he's going to rid us of this vile body this vile body that gets us in trouble Philippians chapter 3, verse number 20. Now, this is why, and this explains, watch this. Here's the psychology behind the whole heaven thing and looking forward. To, this explains why, statistically, senior people look more for heaven than younger people. Doesn't it make sense? Now, I'm not saying young people don't look for heaven, but I'm going to tell you something. When you're young, you know, heaven's not the thing on your mind. Here you are. You're trying to get a job. You're trying to get a raise. Trying to get a raise, trying to get a promotion, trying to get a car, trying to get another car, trying to get a boat because you want to go sailing. Then you have these little creatures that we call kids, and they come in our life. Ain't known us for two years and telling us what they want. I want this. So now you go from trying to get a car, trying to get a car, trying to get that hat, trying to get that purse, trying to get those, those, those clothes, trying to get that, that boat, to now you got to get those clothes for those kids. You got to get, get a new book bag. You need a new pair of tennis shoes. And you, you have all the cares of this life haunting you. But then there's something about someone who is seasoned. They've been there. Had their kids had things in life, drove a car. It might not have been a Lexus, it might have been a Ford T, I don't know. But they drove their car. Been to Disney World and got a souvenir book. Took the cruises. Now, 
Their bodies are undergoing a change. And the sun is beginning to go down. And pains are popping up where pains never popped up before. What used to take you minutes now takes a good while. You used to spring out of bed and go do what you needed to do, but now you do it in stages. You, you, you. The first stage is awareness. The next stage is alertness. The next stage is movement. And then the final stage, 30 minutes later, <laughs> progress. And, and, and you sit back and you see all this young, vibrant energy. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Got grandkids and they're pulling you like you can run just as fast as they can. Come on here, come on here. And you begin to come to the realization that you don't have much longer. Now, nobody knows where death is, but when age creeps upon you, you come to the realization that you don't have much longer. Then your language begins to change. You start talking about your insurance, burial plots. Brother Bill Sr., I used to get him, I used to say, don't, I don't want to hear about that. He said, he, he said you know, yeah, you young men got to take it on. Well, I've, you know, you can make sure you get, and then you try to advise younger people, and they can't relate because they're not in that stage in life. I don't want to have a conversation about buying my burial plot right now. Why? Because in our minds somewhere, we feel like we got years to live. So we're not thinking about heaven. We sing mansion, robe, and crown, and what moves us is the rhythm of the song and not the words. Oh, I'm talking to somebody up in here, whether you admit it or not. Huh? We say, when, when, you know, when the say get to heaven, and, and we just sing, when the say get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing. But there's nothing about those words that's in our spirit. Why? Because we got so much to do in this life. And so guess what? It becomes more of a challenge when you're younger to think about heaven than when you're older. But the truth of the matter is, even if death doesn't come first, with you lying in the grave, Jesus is coming soon. And you don't know when he's coming. And you don't know, you don't know the day or the hour. As a matter of fact, Jesus doesn't even know when he's coming. but he's coming again. And when he comes, he's going to rid us of this body. So as I speak this lesson, there's a generation in here that this means nothing to. You're fading out. You're thinking about what you're going to do later. You're thinking about what you need to do and what you're going to cook. You're not into this. You're not here. You're not here. And the reason why you're not here is because somewhere in your mind, you think you got time. And, 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 and so because you think you have time, heaven is not that appealing. Getting a new body is not that, that appealing. You know why? Because I ain't got no problems with this body. Oh, come on in this house. I ain't got no problem with this body. I can jump. I can run. I can do this. We're going to go play basketball. I'm, we're going to, you know, you know. I ain't got no problem with this body. So there's nothing about this body that makes me want another body. But there is something about this life that'll bring us to wanting a better life. No matter what your age is, there are some troubles that are going to make you cry sometimes. There are going to be some things that make you wonder if God is still up there sometimes. There are going to be some trials and some tribulations that make you want to get away somewhere. Well, don't grab a snicker bar or take a cruise. Just know that one of these good old days, he's going to separate us from this body and all the pain and all the tears and all the sorrow and all the hurt will be gone forever. Not just hurt that people do to you, but sometimes I long for heaven so that I won't hurt nobody. I long for heaven because I, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to mess up, but there's a problem. This body gets us in trouble. 
And I'm going to show you this. Go to Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to show you that Jesus will separate us from this vile body. What does the Bible say? Philippians chapter 3. Begin with verse number 20. Read. For our conversation for, is in heaven. Uh-huh. For whence also we look for the Savior. We look and, for the Savior. And the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. He shall change our vile body. He's going to change our vile body. That it may be fashioned. That it may be fashioned. Back unto his glorious body. To his glorious body. According to the works whereby. Do you see this? Jesus is saying you got to, you know, I, I put on flesh and became like you and when I come again I'm going to make you like me that's the promise of the Savior I go to prepare a place for you see it's not just a state but it's a place and, and if I go he says I'll come again to receive you unto myself so that where I am you may be but guess what Jesus is not where he is the way he was and because he's not where he is the way he was we have to become like he is to be where he is do you understand? In other words, Jesus didn't get out the grave with the same body he had before he went in the grave. He didn't ascend up into heaven with the same body he had down here on earth. He had a new body because he was in a new place. And guess what? If we're going to get to that new place, he's going to give us a new body. Now let me show you the dilemma of being in this body. For the generation that really this holds nothing much to because, again, I'm fine. I'm fine. And so we better be careful that we don't make such a heaven for ourselves down here. That this becomes our heaven. Because as beautiful as the world is, you know, Louis says, I see blue skies and... <laughs> I do that every now and then because some of you drift off and I got to get you back here back here Yeah. if it take you looking at me crazy to get you to pay attention I'll do it but as beautiful as this world is rainbows cool breezes autumn leaves God is going to destroy it He's going to destroy this world. So I know that the next world has to be beautiful because this world is not that bad. I mean, you ever wake up in the morning to see the sunrise? Any of you ever see the sunrise? Have you ever seen the sunset? Have you ever been driving on the highway and look up and see a full moon? A beautiful sight. Have you ever been driving and looked up into the sky and saw a shooting star? That's beautiful. But as beautiful as all of that is, God is going to destroy it and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Go to Romans chapter 7. And I'm going to close with this. Romans chapter 7, begin with verse number 14. And I'm not going to get into hell fire. Well, is it literal? Is it, you know, is it, you know, you know, hell is not going to be more attractive if it's figurative. <laughs> and sometimes we get theological and intellectual. You know, well, if you look at the compounds of fire and you look what the chemicals that make fire up, that cannot be possible. Brimstone cannot. Okay, fine, man. Do you, do you, does it make you want to go to hell now? Romans chapter 7, beginning with verse number 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. I'm sold unto sin. Look at the problem, the war that goes on between our bodies and our spirits. How many of you have ever said to yourself, I'm going to do the right thing and just did the wrong thing? How many of you confronted somebody and said, I'm going I'm to say the right thing? And your ears were pierced by their negative response. And all your plans to say the right thing went out the window. I know at least 15 of y'all. <laughs> because there's a war between this body and our spirit. How many of you, uh, amen, said, I'm not going to eat no more? You fill in the blank. 
Some of you say, no, I'm not eating after seven no more. I'm on this new diet. It's the not eat after seven diet. <laughs> and how many of you at 8.30, somebody come and say, come on, let's eat. There's a war between the body and our mind and our spirit, what we, what we do and what we want to do are not always on there. So what we have here is Paul's anthem for this. He says, for that which I do, look at what he says. And then we're going to see what he says as it pertains to the body. He says, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Is that anybody in this house? Anybody find yourself doing the very same thing? that you hate to do, that you hate for others to do. He says, if then I do that which I would not, I consider unto the law that it is good. In other words, I'm saying that I shouldn't be doing it. I'm agreeing with the law. If I hate doing it, then that must mean that there's something wrong with doing it. He says, now then it is no more I that do it, but what? Sin that dwelleth in me. Now, is, now let's watch this. For I know that in me that is in my flesh, that is in my flesh, well, if no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it. Do you see this? It looks confusing. But what all Paul is saying is, why do I feel like that? Yeah, some of you are afraid to fill in those blanks because you know exactly where I'm going. Why do I do the things I do? Okay? There's a song by Parliament. Let me help you, free some of you, because you were already there. Why do I feel like that? Why do I chase the cat? Nothing but the dog in me. Okay? Some of you are going to front like you never heard that before. Front on, my brother, front on. But that's what Paul is saying. That, that's not original. There's something in me that's making me do what I do. It's this, this, this body. That, and then he says there's a law. Watch another law. Verse number 23. He says, but I see another law in my members. When he says members, he's talking about his body. Mm -hmm. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. In other words, there's a law that basically says being in this body makes it hard for me to do what I want to do that's right, and I find that this body is bringing me to the things that I know I should not be doing. And so look at his conclusion. Watch this. He says, verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And the reason why when we get to glory, somebody says, well, what if I want to do wrong in heaven? No, God is going to separate you from this body. That's why you're not going to have this body. Because another reason why this body can't afford to be in heaven is because this body will mess heaven up. And I, and I, I know I'm being facetious with it, but he's going to give us another body not subject to the same temptations that this body is subject to. I don't know about you, but I want that new body. And I don't want it because I got a pro big problem with this body yet. I'm all right with this body right now, but I know that that body is glorious. And I know that body comes with a place. I said, that body comes with a new place, an eternal place, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. I want to talk to those of us who have drifted so far that we feel like we can't come back. I'm talking to you. Yeah, I'm talking to you who think that, that what you did is just so terrible that you can't come back. I'm going to tell you how slick the devil is. Before you mess up, he says, do it. God will forgive you. Then after you mess up, he says, God will never forgive you for that. Uh, do y'all hear what I'm saying? Before, he'll say, do it, do it. You can always ask forgiveness. Then after you do it and you're guilt-ridden, the devil says, hmm. I don't know how you're going to get forgiveness for that. <laughs> Let me tell you something. 
It doesn't matter where you are or what you have done. If you could still hear the voice of God, he can change you. Can you still hear God? Well, Brother Hamilton, you really don't. I don't have to know. I'm going to tell you, I don't want to know. I'm dealing with my own struggles. A lot of people think that, you know, that, that, that you have to say what it is to somebody. I'm going to tell you something. No, no. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, you might need to be careful what you say around some people. Now, I've, I, I'm not, I don't have a problem being transparent, but some people I would not be transparent around. Hello. And not because they're blabbermouths or can't hold water in a bucket. Not necessarily, but because they can't handle knowing your weakness. Some people can't handle knowing everything you're weak in. So it's not good to tell. But just know, this know, just know this. God tells you something about everybody. You know something about everybody in here. Romans 3.23 says this. All have sin. I don't have to know what you did. I know your sin. I know you walk around here and you're so quiet and I don't think you ever heard about Look at her. She's, she's so humble. And look at him. He walks so humble. I don't care how you walk, Jack. Everybody. All. Not y'all. All. I used, to think, I used to think old people didn't sin. There's a little boy coming back. I used to think old people don't. Uh, I, no, it's just a book. No. Mm-mm. I just, what, what could she possibly be doing? Oh! Some of y'all thought that too. Don't even trip. But that's all you need. I, that's all you need to do to qualify for grace. Is be part of the all. Don't categorize it. Yeah, I'm doing something. No, no. Do you want to be delivered? Now, look, 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 listen, listen. Do you want to be delivered? Do you want to be fixed? Do you want to be changed? And you're having a hard time changing, but not that my question is not do you want to change? Listen, do you want to be changed? None of the changes that happen in our life happen from our own strength. When we change physically, that's not from us. God is still working his power in the physical realm. Our anatomy. You think you became, a, you went from a zygote to an embryo to a fetus because of you? God brought that change. And guess what? When you obeyed the gospel, you didn't even bring that change. The Bible says it was through the working of his power power the operation of God he brought that change and guess what when Jesus comes again you you think you're gonna change your body no he's gonna bring that change do you see the consistency so the question is not do you want to change the first question is do you want to be changed do you want God to fix you do you want him to fix you are you hearing me today? Young man, young lady, you want him to fix you? Sister, brother, do you want him to fix you? Or do you want to stay the way you are? Well, if you let him fix you now, then when he comes again, he'll change you and give you a new place with that new body. But if you are not a part of his family, you're going to get a new body but it won't be for the place where he is. He says, where I am, if you do not believe that I'm he, where I am, you can not come. Now you might say, Brother Hamilton, I've been coming to Mountain View uh, for six months and I feel, I'm feeling all right. See, it's not about coming. See, you need to be baptized. Let's just get down to it for the remission of your sins. Church attendance, that's not how, it doesn't come through church attendance. I go to somebody's church contrary to popular belief. You need to get baptized in obedience to the gospel. You need to believe that Jesus died for your sins so much. You need to believe that he was buried and that he got up again so much that you are willing 
to allow him to change you. That's repentance. You're turning your mind from self to him. And you're saying, Lord, I can't fix myself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn to you and I want you to change me. That's repentance. And everybody has to do it. Acts 1730. And you got to believe that Jesus died and was buried and rose again and still lives for your sins. Because of your sins, he did all of that. You need to believe that so much that you're willing to say it. To say it. To say you believe it and not willing to confess it is the equivalent of saying, okay, uh, yeah, we're going to go out with you, my boyfriend. But we're not going to, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to say it. You ashamed of me. Hello. Mm. And me and Carol together, and she said, well, baby, you know, you're my husband, but don't tell nobody. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell anybody. Then there's something wrong. Do you believe you're married to me? If you really believe that, you'll say it. That's the whole idea. Jesus knew who he was, and he said it. And in a moment, we're going to have an invitation song. And it's your time to walk forward. You don't have to give an experience of grace. We're not going to play the snare drum and get everybody all around because it's not about that. What it's about is getting right with God. Getting right with God. And you'll come down these aisles and you'll be asked, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that God raised him from the dead? And that's important. Not just that you believe that he's, that he's the Son of God, but that God raised him from the dead. According to Romans chapter 10, that's part of the confession. That God raised him from the dead. And if you believe it, you'll say it. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to baptize you for the remission of your sin. We're going to baptize you. Now, we're going to baptize you uh, not because it's a tradition. We're going to baptize you because Jesus says in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. It's not enough to come to church. Jesus wants more for you. He didn't want you to just come to church. Guess what? Check this out. He wants you to be his church. So the question is, are you ready? And if you're here and you are a Christian and you know where you are, God knows. God knows where you are. Uh, uh, we're gonna, nobody's going to be saved because of our works, and we understand that, right? But everybody that left Israel or Egypt, all the Israelites, here's a little secret. Come in close. Pay attention now. Watch this. Everybody that left Egypt, okay, didn't make it to Canaan. Did you hear what I said? Now, Egypt is often typified as sin. But see, when God pulls you out of sin, you got to stay out. And just because you've been baptized doesn't mean that uh, you, you're going to make it to Canaan. See, that's why Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I, what is he using? He's using the language of marriage. See, in Jewish culture, it wasn't about the bride. It was about the groom. You know, in our culture, I mean, when I got married, I mean, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, it was almost like they didn't need me. <laughs> Some of you were, yeah, yeah, amen, testify. Go on and testify. Huh? They had a groom standing around waiting in the room with the, with, the, with the groomsmen and they just, you know, they talk about the game, talk about whatever and, and you know, you come out and they tell you, get back in your room. <laughs> and it's all about the bride. You, you know, you know they, they ran, over the, uh, ran over to her and, oh, 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 you, oh, okay, you're not sure. Oh, my God. Oh, and here you are, you know, you got dried up whatever on your face and nobody say nothing because it's all about the bride it's all about oh we have to make sure oh pin the flower right and do this right and all oh, and she comes out all beautiful and you standing there got one pants leg in your sock <laughs> but in Jewish culture it was the other way around in Jewish culture, it was about the groom. The groom was the chief uh, attraction, was the chief, uh, was, was the chief focus in Jewish culture. And that's why the parable of the virgins and the bridegroom coming, that's why it's told like that. And so Jesus is using the language of marriage. He says, because what would happen would, would be that the groom would choose the bride and betroth her. And he would go. Now, now, now I want you to see the imagery. 
Can you imagine, it, you single people, you single women here, can you imagine that your knight in shining armor comes and says, you know what, will you marry me? Gives you a ring, an engagement ring, and then says, now I've got to go, I got to go to Garland. <laughs> you stay way up here in Oak Cliff. I'm going to Garland and I'm, and I'm having us a house built and then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna pick you up and we're gonna have a wedding ceremony and you're gonna live with me. Ooh, some of you getting excited, it's all in your face. <laughs> Didn't hear nothing, 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 no other part of the sermon, just. <laughs> Jesus uses that language. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Listen to him. you believe in God, Believe also in me. In my father's house. Then he, bra then he brags about where he came from. <laughs> he says, there are many mansions. Hmm. That's like somebody, that's like the dude saying, you know what? I'm having us a house built. It's got five bedrooms and three bathrooms and two jacuzzis. <laughs> Some of you, what's wrong? He says, if it were not so, I promise you, I would have told you. And then he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Now look at this. He's showing that he has the right. And if I go, if I go, I'm coming back to receive you to myself. Basically, so that we can be together. So that where I am, and see, and see her job, the bride's job, is to make sure she remains his while he's gone. Because if he comes back, and she's with somebody else, he's not taking her with him. I've come to tell you today, Jesus is still making that declaration. When you obey the gospel, he gives you the engagement ring of his spirit, which is the seal of our redemption. And he says, I'm coming back for you. Keep your ring on. I'm coming back for you. Stay separate. And sometimes we lose the ring or sometimes we outgrow the ring. But stay his. Because when he comes back, he doesn't want to see you with Kevin. Ain't nothing wrong with that. You need to go on for it. He says, when I come back, I want you to be just as mine as you were when we met. I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter what you did. If you want to be fixed today. God will fix you.